When I was in elementary school, we had this process where the counselors would come in to help us figure out what we were going to be when we grew up. So I wrote down on my card that I wanted to be a medical doctor. A week later, they gave us the results. And my counselor said, you are going to be a secretary. So I was like, no, I want to be a medical doctor. And he looked at me and said, oh, no, no. If you work hard, one day you can be a secretary working in a doctor's office. So I was taken aback and concerned and I went home. And my mom saw that I was upset and I said, well, I wanted to be a doctor, but the counselor says that I can only be a secretary in a doctor's office. And she looked at me sternly and said, listen, you can be anything you want to be. Do not let that man define you. If you want to be a doctor, you be a doctor. If you want to be an astronaut, you be an astronaut. If you want to be the president of the United States, you will be the president of the United States. Never ever let them define you. And I want to let others hear the stories of people like me, black women physician leaders. Since I am a family physician, it was a natural process to ask my fellow family medicine black female physician leaders to participate in this conversation. The issues that you are going to hear my colleagues discuss are similar to my experiences and are relevant to many of you. You know, I knew from when I was a little girl that I wanted to help people. And as I got older, um, I developed a love of science and all of that started to crystallize in realizing that becoming a family physician was the way that I could most help people. And I think that, you know, that type of service was something that was instilled in me as I was from just, you know, being a little girl and have just continued to do that outreach again and again. And I think, um, you know, when I first started to pursue medicine, I thought just becoming a doctor was going to be the ultimate. And I remember, you know, finishing medical school and residency and being able to just, you know, go and serve my patients and see people and be able to help them with their medical problems and help them through the transition of their life. And that felt very satisfying and fulfilling and was, you know, reaching my goal of what I wanted to do. I chose medicine as a profession because I had been working during my undergraduate days in a community organization on the near west side of Chicago. And we had a co-op and incidentally I was writing health articles. I took a course in kinesiology in my last semester of high school before graduating and combined with the community organization, the writing the health articles, I understood from the people in the community that they needed health care and I was encouraged to go into medical school as a result of that experience. I have always wanted to take care of people, particularly my people, the people of my culture and community. And so um, I went into medicine in order to do that. In particular, I went into family medicine because I wanted to be able to take care of anyone who walked into my door. Um, and that provides you the most um, broad uh, training so that I can see kids, adults, older people, deliver babies if I need to do minor procedures. I want it to be the one-stop shop for anyone. Well, I remember I was about 12 years old and I was visiting my best friend, Scott Rutherford, and his mom was a, a surgical nurse and Scott was getting late and I was waiting with his mom in the kitchen and she's like, Renee, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, well, Ms. Rutherford, I'd like to, I'm really good at science and people like to talk to me. So I think I'll be a doctor. It was like the first time I put it together. And she looked at me and she said, you'll be an excellent Dr. Renee. And it really, really got me going. I was like, oh, she's a nurse. She actually knows doctors. I could do this. So about 12. As you can see, my colleagues chose medicine for a variety of reasons. For me, it was because both my parents were in healthcare. My dad was a surgeon, and my mom was a nurse who always wanted to be a physician, but was told earlier in her life that women couldn't be doctors. Going from high school to undergraduate school 
to medical school and in this profession, we are underrepresented. And my career has been such that I've often been the only person in the room. And our voices, therefore, are not heard. Again, we're invisible. I can say one thing, and the person next to me will say the exact same thing. And they will be given credit for the idea. That happens on a regular basis. And so we're constantly trying to break that glass ceiling. And I've been fortunate to be able to do that. So um, it's the assumptions. And I think that was really irritating. And then it's also hearing things about patients who happen to be your same color. And, um, and then the ever popular, well, I don't think of you as black, which was, it's never a pleasant thing to hear from people who you assumed had some sense. And so you have these ideas about knowing that people have these preconceived notions about who you are and, and how you must act. And if I'm told I'm articulate one more time, I'm gonna lose it. Articulate means you can speak a language. This is English, I was, <laughs> this is my native tongue. I should be able to speak it. So it's, it's, it's the constant we, overcoming the fact that when I achieve something, people are surprised. I went to Harvard for medical school, um, and during my first rotation, which was a neurology rotation, there was an attending. We were sitting around the table. Um, I felt as if at the beginning I was targeted somehow. Um, and he would tell jokes. Um, one of the, I think he wanted to do like a fist bump or something, and I really wasn't down for that connection because you're my attending. Um, and there was also, he was telling these jokes and one of the jokes I decided not to laugh at. I didn't think it was funny. I don't remember it being particularly racially charged or anything, but it just, it didn't land with me. However, that seemed to ruin the rest of our encounter. Um, and I actually had to end up going to the Dean in order to make sure that I could pass that course. Um, and that is something uh, that really, like, it, I, didn't, I didn't fail. I was able to pass, but I had to get intervention to pass because I didn't do a fist bump and laugh at a joke. And that was because I was, I think, the only black woman or person in that room. Um, and so that is an example of racism um, and how it plays out in the classroom and how it can actually really affect your career. Um, if you don't have the ability to go and get other people involved and intervene. A lot of times when I look back now though, I see, I see the times where I thought it was me, where I thought that um, I just wasn't smart enough or I just didn't know the right people, I didn't show up at the right space in the right time. And I look back now and I realize it probably wasn't that at all, that it probably was that people had made decisions about me and about who I could be and who I was supposed to be long before they ever really took the time to get to know me. And so that I think had everything to do with me being a black woman. And truth be told, I think that happens even today. So that often when you know you sort of tell someone, you walk in a room and you tell someone what you do and you oh, I work in healthcare. And their first thing is, oh, you must be a nurse. No, I'm not a nurse. I mean, I love nurses and nurses are great, but that's that's not what I do. I'm, I'm a physician. And then you start to explain to them, you know, I'm not, I'm not even just a physician, even though I think being a physician is enough. I'm actually a physician leader. I, I run a department and they look at you like a department, like a whole department. And you're like, well, I mean, would you have asked someone else that question? I mean, why, why would you think that I couldn't do that? And so sometimes I think the barriers were subtle, um, where people seem to be your ally. They seem to be on your side, but either they just didn't know how to support you or their way of supporting you was really a way of being subversive and actually holding you back from sort of taking the thing that they wanted and that they wanted to have. I remember a time when um, I was in medical school and we would be with another physician shadowing them and she would always introduce me to her patients. This is Keisha, she's, um, she's a medical student, she's learning to become a doctor and we had this one patient and she said, oh, that's great that you have nurses in the office, we have a nursing shortage, it's so great that you're gonna become a nurse. And the doctor was a female physician, so the patient is used to having female doctors. And the doctor says, no, 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 she's not going to be a nurse. She's going to be a doctor like me. And the patient says, that's great, we need more nurses. And we just kind of went on this 
ongoing thing and you know eventually gave up but she just couldn't wrap her mind around the idea that I was going to be a doctor and you know I think we've all had um, you know the occasion when you're in the hospital rounding on a patient and the patient tries to hand you their hospital tray because they think you're the cafeteria person coming to take their food he said like, no no I'm here to examine you I'm your doctor um, I remember one night in the hospital uh, as an intern and it just so happened that all of the um, staff, that, the house staff that night were all black female physicians. And a patient came in and the intern went in to assess him. And he said, oh, I don't want that doctor. And the other intern was a black female and the resident was a black female. And it just so happened that the ER attending and our attending were all black females. And he said, well, sir, if you're gonna get admitted here tonight, it's gonna be one of us. <laughs> he, he got admitted. <laughs> We, in, in general, black folk, persons of African descent, are invisible. And when I was in medical school, it was difficult during, particularly during the academic as well as the clinical rotations. We would get denigrated on a regular basis on the clinical wards. We would be asked questions, and if we did not have the answer, there would be overt criticism and denigration of us on the clinical rotations. Some of my colleagues would even look at us and ask us why we, why we would even take such criticism. But we couldn't say anything. Our grade depended on us being silent during that period of time while we were going through those clinical rotations. There is one time during my surgical rotation when an attending decided that I could not join him in the operating room unless I finished seeing all of my patients plus all of the patients of my male colleague. And so I would have to get up two hours earlier in order to make sure everyone was seen and then join him in the operating room because my male colleague was allowed to join him without seeing any of the patients. Mind you, surgeries always started at 7.30 a.m. And then during surgery, I noticed that for the black patients, he would treat them differently. He would make snide comments about them. And some of the procedures he would do were questionable. And I would make it my duty to tell patients in the clinic setting, in the pre-op setting, try to book with another surgeon. It still haunts me to this day. I, I can't see something wrong and not have an opinion or have a voice or help with an effort, not just call it out, but help with a solution. I've tried to be passive. I've tried to just put my head down, focus on being getting good grades and being a good doctor. I tried to do that. It just doesn't work for me viscerally. Like I just, it doesn't make me happy. It doesn't keep me balanced. And so leadership is a part of who I am and I, I just have to do it. And I have to do it for myself and I have to do it for my, for my patients and the people I serve. Sometimes, you know, being a leader might mean being medical director at your clinic, but that may not suit you five years down the road. Then being a leader might mean organizing a farmer's market for your community or joining, you know, becoming a school board member or, you know, your, your goals may change. You may still want to lead, but you may want to do it in a different way or within a different organization because we should continue to evolve and grow. We will continue to evolve and grow. And that's all right. So you don't feel like you have to hold so fast to what you said you were gonna do five, 10 years ago because you think you're on this track and you can't deviate. You're not failing if you modify the plan because you're gonna change. You may have a family. You may have a sick parent one day. You may just get tired, you know? You may get burnt out. You may go to some event and get super like, lit up by something and say, oh my God, I want to work in this area. So then you do. And I think that all of us have talents. The person who can play that piano or that violin at a young age. And so for me, I've been an advocate early on uh, as a teenager in high school, in, in, in undergraduate school. I was a leader in some of our organization helping to be a founder for black student organizations. 
I was a member and leader in Student National Medical Association. I became the 100th president of the National Medical Association, which represents African American physicians. I've also been on the board for the American Academy of Family Physicians and the speaker for our Congress of Delegates. And I've also been the first African American president of the State Association, the Illinois Academy of Family Physicians. And in my role of being on the board for the American Academy of Family Physicians, I was the first African American and the third woman speaker for our Congress of Delegates. So that is a path of advocacy that I have taken throughout my career. It's a road less traveled and we must travel that road. We must pave the way for those who have come behind us and follow those who have led the way. And I, I see it as an honor. I played sports with lots of different kinds of people all over the country. And I knew that I know how to work teams. I know how to be on a team. I know how to lead a team. And so that sort of, you know, when you start feeling that when you're six years old and you never stop feeling that, it doesn't go away. And I'm in the situation where I feel really fortunate is I really like being on teams and not necessarily leading them, but the person who's leading them, they have to be really good. Because if they're not, then I probably need to lead that team. <laughs> and um, so it, it was just that feeling where, you know, at some point in your life, as you get older, there's a point in your life when you're going to be at the age where the people you went to high school with are running the country. So you think about that. And it's really, it's lead, follow, or get out of the way in so many ways. Um, I work in my community. So I work um, in Harlem. I've been in Harlem since 2010. Um, I have, I live in my community. I work in my community. I walk in my community. My, my child goes to school in the community. I shop in my community. And I think that um, having a presence, not just seeing patients there, but like being of the community um, and knowing my culture, um, speaking the language, understanding like the cultural um, norms uh, really makes a difference where people feel like they can connect to you and then they're able to, they're willing to listen, they're willing to have you um, be their leader. And so I feel, I have, I feel like that is a, uh, something that I've been earning because I am young and I'm young to that community, but because people see that I care and I'm passionate, they allow me to, to help even more. For me, I'm not sure being the first born in a family automatically places you in a leadership role as a child. I do know that I've been pushed to take on positions, and when I did well, I continue to find that I'm not so bad at this. Honestly, I'm pretty good at it. I grew up, I'm a senior in terms of age, and I grew up during the civil rights era. I remember being in high school when uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. We had to get home any way we could. And the, the majority students, the white students and others were bused from school because we were in a predominantly African-American neighborhood. And they were bust, and we had to get home any way we could. And Chicago, of course, had riots and a lot of burning of communities. So during that period, there were a lot of people who were persons who were fighting for our rights. And I was able to look at them as mentors. So my mom was a mentor. Uh, surrogate mothers, extended family were, were mentors for me. I like and love to mentor myself personally. So even my mentees can serve as mentors for me because I learn from them as well as from those mother figures that I had and for those members in the community who made it their business to ensure that we had our rights. Um, my mom, motherhood was the most important thing to her and so she sacrificed a lot for us to do whatever we wanted to do. My mother's a very intelligent woman and what she wanted me to do more with my intelligence and just be at home or just serve Biloxi, Mississippi, she said, you know, grow wings and fly and I'll be there to support it. Whether you're a basket weaver or, you know, the next attorney, I want to be there to support you. And because she's been so supportive and, and has so much wisdom, she's definitely been one of my biggest supporters and my inspiration. It's just true. Everyone's grandmother, it seems, is their first 
but she was just the tiniest little woman and you know and she gave the best hugs and she would just always tell me that you know she was just kind to everybody I mean homeless people would come to her back door knowing that she would feed them and um, and she had I want to say seven kids and six of them were turned into were girls and turned into some of the most powerful women <laughs> that I've ever met. They had very strong personalities in my aunts, and um, they, they mentored me in so many different ways. But the biggest thing is just strength. There was nothing that you couldn't do because they were like, no one's gonna stop you. The only person who stops you is yourself. The mentorship starts with your family. Um, you know, my grandparents especially, my grandmother's getting ready to turn 100. And, you know, the more I learn about her story, as she's getting older, we're really trying, you know, to gather her story and learning not just about her, but her parents and grandparents and the struggles that they went through. And I take so much strength from that. Um, and the challenges that they've gone through makes my challenge seem insignificant. And so I learned so much from that. For me, my mother was my first mentor and has stayed as my cheerleader from childhood. Remember, she's the one that said to me, you can be anything you want to be. And she, in her career, has continued to go over different barriers, different boundaries, has gained multiple degrees, and I have followed in her path. It is, it is very difficult to be a black woman. It's a blessing, it's a curse, it's everything in between. And sometimes the things that make us the most special and the most unique and the most qualified and the most suited for the thing that we want to do, whatever the passion is that's burning inside of us, is the exact thing that people are going to attack you for and that they're going to challenge you on and that they're going to make you sort of question your own ability and question yourself. And, and if I only had one thing for other people to take away from them because I feel like it took me way too long in life to figure it out, you're not here for them. I think what has helped me is people reminding me that you're stronger than you think you are. And, you know, a lot of times I didn't necessarily see it in myself, but somebody else pushed me. And um, when you find that somebody's pushing you and you maybe have a little bit of spark, step out on faith, um, and that'll take you a lot farther than maybe you thought it would. I, as a mentor, I believe I advise those persons, students who are interested in leadership to one, be prepared. Know what role you're going into, know what the requirements are for that role that you want to pursue. We still have to be more prepared than our colleagues and the things that we want to do. Be articulate, don't be shy. Ensure that you have a mentor who's had the experience and could provide you with the ins and outs as well as the support that you may need for the challenges that you may face and yes you will face a lot of challenges but don't be dissuaded from taking that path it's necessary we must do it it's a requirement from my perspective and so we have a lot of work to do as much as things have changed things have remained the same. As a matter of fact, those of us who are older believe that we've gone backwards in a, in a lot of instances in regards to the gains that have made, been made and the gains that we no longer have in our society as a whole. We talk about health equity and social determinants of health, and if you look at the statistics, you see that we, in, in many of them, we are worse off than some persons have been than in, 18, in the 1800s. That must change. And so the struggle continues. Um, I th honestly, it's probably the last part I put is gratitude. It's like that constantly centers me because I don't do fear anymore because fear just holds you back and, and closes you down and doesn't keep you able to understand that there's so many different possibilities. Fear is not something I do. Gratitude, whenever I feel fear, I just call up something I'm grateful for. And it allows me to center myself and move forward. Because that's, I think, one of the most critical traits for a leader. 
is you have to be centered. And you have to be able to walk in places that are scary without fear. I believe that it's important being here. Service is the rent that we pay for being here. And because there's still so much work to do, don't be dissuaded. There, you will find along your path, along this journey, there are others with whom you can collaborate, with whom you can get that support, who feel as passionate about the work as you do. Join forces with them because we cannot do this alone. Don't lose your passion, have the vision, be prepared. I can't always say that you'll be successful, but certainly you are not alone and, and continue with the things that you want to do. In completing this project, I am proud to have had the opportunity to have discussions with these phenomenal physicians. Since the time of this recording, each of them has gone on to higher positions in leadership to develop opportunities for others and to provide a broader support and network. My hope is that people young and old will watch this and realize that you can be a leader in your field. You can be what you aspire to be. There are many obstacles along the way, but as have been shown here, all of us have faced them and out of sheer will, determination, support, tenacity, we have been allowed to thrive.